I just want to say thank you to uh, everyone who uh, is here. Um, my name is Audrey. I will be doing a workshop today on narrative and conflict. Uh, I do have uh, a presentation, but I have tried to incorporate some um, participatory elements. So I want to say first, you know, please do um, introduce yourselves in the chat if you would like to. Uh, you know, you can say your name, if, if you feel comfortable, say where you're call calling in from, um, you know, maybe even start thinking about, okay, what does storytelling mean to you? What do you want to learn about storytelling? Things like that. Um, and, you know, I'll try to monitor the chat as we go along and kind of incorporate that a little bit. It'll be a little different, you know, if we were all in the same room, the participatory element would be maybe a little bit easier. Um, but in this case, the virtual element means that uh, I get to see faces that might, I might not, there, not otherwise be seeing. So um, before I get started, I just want to say that uh, this is recording. You'll see in the top left corner that the recording button is on. So just kind of be aware of that. Um, I will be using or trying to use the breakout session function a little bit later on if, if it makes sense. You know, this kind of um, you know, number of people, I might just keep us all in the same room. Um, but I will make that decision when I come to it. And then it'll be up to the technology and whether I know how to use it in order to, to do a breakout. But I would like to say, you know, if we do go to breakout sessions, I will ask um, one person in each session to um, kind of volunteer to, to be the recorder and reporter out, so to speak. Um, uh, which I know is always kind of like a weird thing. So um, if you already know that that's something you would like to do, uh, and want to let me know by sending a private message in the chat, you can do so. You can also put it like publicly in the chat too, it's just, it's just put it however you're comfortable. Um, and you know, we're, we're gonna cross that bridge when we come to it um, and kind of figure out what best works best for the, the people gathered here. Um, but I guess what I wanna say is I really want this to be a little bit more participatory. I don't wanna just talk at, I would also like to talk with and also learn from uh, the people who are on this call as well. Um, so you are all here and have all seen, I'm sure, that this is part of uh, the inaugural Carter School Peace Week. Uh, this is an initiative that um, we are doing for the first time uh, as the Jimmy and Roslyn Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution. I think probably most of you on this chat know, but if you don't, we used to be the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution this past summer. We became, became the Jimmy and Roslyn Carter School, which is a really uh, big thing for us and a really exciting time and also really helps center us in, you know, what our responsibility is as a school of conflict analysis and resolution of peace and conflict resolution now. So this whole week has just been a, a lot of different events that can really showcase the different ways that our faculty, our students, our staff members, uh, our alumni approach uh, the, the field of peace and conflict studies and the, you know, the big question of how do we, uh, you know, get to a more peaceful world, a more just world, a more equitable world. So I um, will at, at some point uh, put a link in, in the chat to you know, the other events that are happening. Um, we have a whole full other day of events tomorrow uh, that I'm sure you won't wanna miss. And there will also be recordings. Um, so I'll also link to where you can find those recordings uh, probably in the next few weeks. They probably won't be up like tomorrow. Um, but you know, uh, hopefully you know, within the next month, you'll be able to go back and, and see how all of the events have gone and, and revisit them. Um, so with that, I just wanna say thank you again to, to everyone who's here. Uh, if you know me personally, you know that my entire life at this point is about storytelling, for better or for worse. Um, and it, it's something that just really fascinates me. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my background. I came here to the Carter School two years ago as a master's student, uh, which I am finishing up now this semester. Um, I am doing a thesis that looks at identity, uh, so social identity, narrative, and um, music uh, in the, the Turkish-Kurdish conflict. And I'll be talking a little bit more about this thesis. Um, thank you, someone mentioned that um, Mrs. Carter's name is Rosalind, so I really appreciate that. Thank you. That is also a narrative, uh, a narrative thing, so I wanted to mention that. Um, that was a private message to me, but I just wanted to say thank you. Um, publicly and, and note that that is a correction of um, Rosalind's name. So thank you very much. Um, 
So uh, I'll be talking a little bit more about my thesis and my work at the Carter School uh, a little bit further on in this presentation, but I want to center this in the fact that um, as I've been studying narrative and conflict here at the Carter School, I have also been the Carter School storyteller and news editor, which uh, means that I have been writing reporting, writing, and editing the stories that go up on our news page, uh, among other things. Uh, and what it has been for me is one, just kind of a way for me to fulfill a lifelong dream, dream of mine, which has been, um, you know, being able to tell stories. I have always loved stories since I was little. Uh, I wanted to be an English major for various reasons was not, but still took a lot of uh, literature courses and creative writing courses in undergrad. And I came here, uh, having been a political science major, knowing I wanted to still focus in on, you know, that bigger question of how do you make the world a better place, but also kind of revisit my, my deep love of story. And then the other side of it, too, is that being the, the Carter School storyteller at the same time as being a master's student at the Carter School has meant that many of the things that I've been learning in my class, my, my, my classes, my, um, in my courses, I have been able to then figure out how to apply them in various different ways to the stories that I've been writing. Now, whether or not I've successfully applied them is a whole other question, but it has been a really wonderful experience to be able to be doing in some sense as I am learning. And I'm, you know, this, this presentation um, and workshop will hopefully kind of synthesize some of that. And I want to just kind of put out at the, at the start that, um, you know, I know a lot more than I did two years ago, and I'm also um, perpetually, like all of us, perpetually a student and, and perpetually learning. So I really want to um, uh, invite you all to also in the chat, and then, you know, when we get to more participatory uh, parts of this presentation, if you feel comfortable um, via voice and video, to also offer your uh, reflections, questions, comments on uh, the intersection of narrative and conflict. Um, so this um, workshop today is focused very much in on kind of what I've been trying to wrap my head around, which is this question of how do you tell a good story, one that's compelling, one that kind of, you know, you, you like if, if it's a book, right, you can't put it down. If it's a television show, you, you can't help but binge it, you know. Um, how do you tell that kind of story while also making sure that the story you're telling does good in the world, right? And by good here, what I mean is, is a story that transforms conflict from destructive conflict towards more of a, a positive piece, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about what I mean um, and what the field means by positive piece a little bit later on. But basically what I'm trying to do is, uh, you know, work around this idea that good compelling stories are not necessarily stories that are also conflict transformative, you know, stories that that lead us to peace. You can have really good, compelling stories that um, lead you away from peace, for example. And that's a really, that, you know, we're gonna break it down. Um, so that is a kind of very simple view on it. Um, and I'll, you know, be talking a little bit why you need to break it down because if you, you leave it out, what does a good story mean? Well, um, that in and of itself is a storytelling technique that is very simplified. Um, and when you're moving stories towards uh, conflict transformation, you want to actually complexify it. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, before I start, I just want to, you know, uh, put out into the world that much of what uh, I'm go going to talk about, um, I have done not in only in my classroom, classrooms, but in my practice as the career school storyteller and have not been able to do so without everything that I've learned from um, uh, the faculty members here at the school, specifically Solon Simmons and uh, Sarah Cobb, whose narrative uh, classes and narrative uh, practice and narrative research have been really transformative for me. Um, also, I want to, you know, say, you know, platform um, everything that I've learned from Karina Corstelina, who is my thesis chair, as well as um, Daniel Rothbart, who is also on my thesis committee. Uh, and I'll be talking a little bit about their work in this presentation as well. Um, also, you know, something that I'm not going to talk about a lot today, but, you know, one of the other positions um, that I've had is uh, as a team member of the John Mitchell Jr. Program for History, Justice, and Race at this school. Um, and that is led by uh, Dr. Charles uh, Chavis Jr. And I have had the position of uh, Director of Communications and that role has really helped me kind of see, again, how do you put some of the theory of narrative and conflict into the practice, specifically in this case, the practice around um, 
promoting racial justice through narrative change. I'm not going to talk a lot about that in, in this workshop, but I did just want to kind of throw that out there. And finally, I do want to thank my fellow students as well. I've learned as much from them uh, as I have, um, you know, uh, from my professors in many ways, um, some of whom are on this call. So I just want to say thanks. Uh, and that's, you know, one reason why it's so cool to be at this school. Um, so that was a really long introduction. I am going to go ahead and get started with my presentation. Again, if you have any questions, any thoughts, anything you know that you want to talk about, you can talk about it in the chat and there will be participatory elements that we can that we will have um, during this presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So you can see the slides. I'm going to go ahead and get started from here. So this is, you know, probably should have had this up while I was doing my introduction. But yeah, this is this is what we're doing today. Uh, a workshop in zoom times, which will be fun. So I just want to go through quickly um, kind of the agenda of this presentation uh, of this workshop. I'm going to start with discussing the power of storytelling and kind of complicating that a little bit, a little bit, then we're going to go on to kind of the elements of what makes a compelling story. Following that, I'm going to go to my first breakout session uh, and invite you all to um, uh, listen in to a uh, clip from a video um, of Stuart Eisenstadt, who was an advisor to uh, President Carter telling the Camp David story. And then we're going to talk a little bit about that. Then we're going to go on to what makes a conflict transformative story. And uh, this is a, you know, I am uh, having a hard time saying this word because it is a mouthful. And I'm going to talk a little bit why I've chosen this uh, type of description specifically. Then once we talk about that, we're going to go to um, the clip again and kind of revisit it from a, a different lens. Finally, I'm going to kind of pull in some of my experiences in both my research with my thesis, as well as my practice as the uh, Carter School storyteller to talk a little bit about a little bit more about um, being a conflict transformative storyteller. And then I'm going to go to a Q&A and group discussion and really hope that you all get get involved because I really want to hear from you. Um, and hear any insights that you all have as well. And just like, see you all because the times are lonely right now and it's fun to connect in this way. So um, just to begin, I, I just wanna say that, um, you know, we hear a lot, I think nowadays about the power of storytelling. I think, you know, storytelling is definitely a key word that um, I think people think brings up some excitement, right? Um, there's something a little bit magical about it, a little bit mystical about it. And I think, you know, when we hear storytelling, when I hear storytelling too, I know that I really want storytelling to be a very positive thing, right? So there's, and I, I haven't really, I, you know, there's a description of humans as a storytelling animal, right? That we understand the world that we are in through stories, that we make the world that we are in through stories. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the conflict um, transformative part of this uh, presentation. But I think, you know, ultimately storytelling is a very positive thing, right? It's very central to who we are as people, as communities, as, you know, broader, um, you know, groups, um, as countries uh, globally as well. Um, but even if you just take it down to the personal level, right, when you're thinking about the way that you consume stories. Why, why is it that we want to consume stories, right? Well, they remind us who we are and they also make us who we are, right? We tell stories about ourselves and others. Um, and those stories can be reflections, but they are also um, ways to reaffirm who we are or change who we are. And then that kind of uh, shifts reality a little bit. Um, they bring us together in groups. You know, we, we tell stories, you know, you call up your friend because you've got a funny story or a sad story. Um, you, you know, sit down and, um, you know, tell people about your day. You bond over a shared experience of a TV show or a movie or, or a song, right? You know, the, the feeling that you get when you are in, you know, a crowd watching a concert and you, you know, you don't know like, anyone around you and yet you are kind of bonded by this experience um, of witnessing this storytelling act which is the music right so it brings us together just you know bluntly stories entertain us right um, you know you sit down you come home after a long day or we're always home after a long day now um, and you sit down on the couch and you you know watch a show or you read a book or 
or you sit and, and talk with your roommate or your partner or your sibling um, about their day and, and you laugh, right? Um, we want to be entertained in that way. Or you scroll through social media, which is a whole different type of storytelling, right? And then finally, you know, stories are rooted in our traditions. We have oral storytelling tra traditions, we have written storytelling tra traditions, visual storytelling traditions. Um, you know, I think when we hear story, we think of, you know, very much um, the, you know, speaking, right? We think that story is in words, but that's not necessarily the case. You know, we do music and yes, music might have lyrics, but music um, often does not have lyrics, right? Or it has lyrics, but the lyrics don't really mean the same thing if you take them outside of the actual music, musical elements, right? And then there's dance, right? And I, I this is something that I'm not gonna talk about a lot, but I um, am someone who has a lot of experience as a dancer. And so that's a very different type of storytelling, right? There's a whole language within dance, but even half the time, I don't know it. And I, and I grew up learning dance um, and learning different traditions of dance. Um, so if you all want to, to you know, just think a little bit um, about where you, we find stories and put those in the chat. And what I mean by that is like, when you think of a story, where do you think stories live? Right? I'd be very curious to see what everyone thinks about that. I'm going to keep going on, but definitely, you know, I want you to consider that in the chat um, of, you know, where you think that you find stories and where they kind of pop out for you. So I'm going to go ahead and actually to kind of reinforce this idea of, of storytelling being something that is really important and, and something that it's not just something that we're talking about a lot nowadays, but it is, it is a, a way that we live our lives. I'm going to go ahead and have you all listen to a section of a song from um, my thesis research. Um, so this is a group called Kardesh Turkular. They're, the translation of that is Ballads of Solidarity. Um, it's a group that sings in multiple different languages in Turkey. Um, and this song is called Kervane, which means uh, caravan. Um, I am not going to make you listen to the whole thing because it's nine minutes long and that would be just excessive, um, but I am gonna have you all listen to a section of it. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing so that you can all listen to that. Um, I'm gonna go over. And I, just as I go over, you know, some people are saying brands are stories, life is a story, um, stories about the work that is being made possible by donors. We find stories and how we interpret the actions of the people closest to us too. I think that's, that's really, really lovely stuff. Um, we are surrounded by stories every single day and we are consuming them and we are also telling them. Um, even if we're not in like a traditional storyteller role, right? We're, we are telling stories all the time. So I'm gonna go over to this, now you can see my OneDrive. I'm gonna go over to um, this song and play it for you all. I'm gonna share my screen again. Not that there's a video element to this, but I just think it's nice to be able to see it, just a moment. Um, actually, no, I'm probably not gonna do that. So I'm just gonna go ahead and play it. If you can't hear it, let me know. So it's just a section, it's about 40 seconds long. <laughs> So that was just a section of it. I hope it you all could hear it. Um, I actually got so sucked into the song that I it didn't stop it. I, you heard a little bit more of it, but now I'm going to go over to the um, lyrics again. I'm going to share my screen again. Um, and basically, oh no. Okay, so here were some of the lyrics that you heard. 
Um, and so on the, the left is the Kurmanji lyrics, on the right is the English. I'm gonna go ahead and um, say them out loud just in case you know, people are not you know, reading this right now. Um, but basically the lyrics that I, I you know, wanted to draw attention to was, um, the caravan is on the road, my heart is burning, grandmother, the cold of foreign lands is upon us, my wound is deep, come now, wear your dress, dear elder, grandmother, tell us tales of our homeland and of foreign lands. And actually, uh, the lyrics that continued, because I, again, got two steps into the song and didn't stop it uh, at the right time, it actually continues with the grandmother saying something along the lines of, I can see our village, I can see our, our elders, I can see our, um, you know, my friends and the children, I can see the starry sky. Um, and basically, I'll tell you a little bit more about the story in this song. Basically, it is a song about um a community of people um because they're you know the the lyrics are in kurdish they are kurdish um uh, kurdish in turkey specifically and i'm not going to go into the entire history of the turkish kurdish conflict which is itself you know composed of many different narratives but basically in this song um and, and, I, and I hope that you can hear it a little bit in the actual musical elements of it is there there's a sadness here um you know, this is a caravan and uh, some Kurdish communities um, are nomadic and so, and have been nomadic in the past. Um, and so a caravan might be, for example, uh, an element of Kurdish history and Kurdish stories. Uh, but in this case, there is a sadness to it. There's a sadness to the um, migration and movement because in this story, and you can see a little bit of it here in this stanza, um, the implication, it is implied that uh, this community, this family has been displaced, that um, displaced by conflict. And it doesn't get very explicit about what the conflict was, but you can, um, there, there is a repetition in this song of elements of burning. Um, here you see my heart is burning, so obviously that's pain, but there are other elements later on that give the sense that, you know, there was a burning of wherever it was that they were, they were living, and so now they're on the road again, and, and, and the sense of it's for the last time, right? You know, they're not gonna be returning here. Um, the cold of foreign lands is upon us. So it's the sense of they're not only moving somewhere else, but moving somewhere that's not where they would unnecessarily be. Um, my wound is deep, obviously, I, that's very clear, right? Like there's a pain here. Um, and I think the, you know, the thing that I really wanna kind of focus in on for this workshop specifically is this, la these last three lines of, Come now, wear your dress, dear elder. Grandmother, tell us tales of our homeland and of foreign lands. Um, so I think this goes back to the element that I was saying of the power of storytelling is that it brings us together, right? It tells us who we are. In this case, it's, it's telling the specific, you know, wh whoever's narrating it, who, you know, their grandmother is telling them who they are as a family, right? Who they are as a culture, um, you know, what, what their story is. I have been, you know, I it just, Pulling it back personally, I have been very lucky to have heard st many, many stories from my own grandmother. And, you know, that's one of my most vivid, vivid childhood memories is, you know, falling asleep with her telling stories, not just, you know, fables or things like that, but stories from her own life, right? And those become stories that kind of make up me, right? So I think what I really wanted to show here is that, um, again, the, the power of storytelling is that we are always storytelling. And I, this is kind of meta in the sense that this is a story about storytelling, right? So we've got the stanza talking about storytelling here, but the song itself is also a storytelling, you know, a, an act of storytelling. Um, so I think that that's really uh, powerful. I'd love to chat more about it, you know, if anyone has any questions about, generally speaking, my thesis, but I wanna keep it focused in on, on this workshop. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about what makes a good story. Um, and a, a good story, um, has a lot of different elements. These are not exhaustive, but these are uh, elements that I have come across in, again, my own research, my learning, and my practice. So a good story, one that, again, think about the one that keeps you turning the pages. It has stakes. You know, there's a tension. There's a tension in the plot, conflict. There's a tension between the characters. Um, and that that is very satisfying, right? You You kind of want, when you start listening to watching a story, you want a reason for why that story is important, right? Um, and a good compelling story will give you stakes. That stake, the stakes won't look the same in any type of story, but um, you will know that there is a reason why you are consuming that story. Um, genre and style. So here I wanna talk about, you know, um, 
thinking about the elements that make a story, you know, keep you at, you know, the edge of your seat, right? So maybe there's a lot of action and there's a lot of suspense and the way that the person is telling the story has made it so that um, you just can't look away, right? Um, and that's a story that might get your heart racing. That's a story that might, um, you know, again, you, you're not gonna look away. So you're really, really sucked in. Um, but there are also ways to make really reflective and indulgent stories. Um, I kind of gravitate towards these. I really like these, you know, they're, they might be, the pacing might be a little bit more slow. So it's kind of calm. You might be um, put in a place where you're ruminating a little bit more about what it is that you're reading or watching. Um, but they still are attention getting in the sense that, you know, you still kind of want to know what happens, right? It's just like, you know, this, you know, whereas the other one might have been the one where you're on the edge of your seat, this one might be the one that you're reading in bits and pieces or watching in bits and pieces, and then you go away and you're doing your normal work, but it's still there. It's still sitting with you, right? And you're still ruminating upon it. And there might be something about it that is comforting in a way. And then you've got like comedic and lighthearted stories, right? Like, I don't know about you all, but for me, like, I don't really want to watch dramas right now. I don't want to watch anything that's sad. I just, I just want to watch things that make me laugh. Um, and they can still be very compelling stories and they can still have really deep messages. But at the end of the day, you know, life right now is a little bit intense. And so maybe, you know, when I go to consume, you know, very purposefully consume a story, um, I might be looking for something that's a little bit more um, comedic. Now, you know, there's, I could, Kind of break this discussion open a lot further but i don't want to do that for the sake of time but right you know then you could break open comedy and you've got different types of comedy you've got dark comedy you've got satire right but so these are some of the elements that you know i guess what i'm trying to say is that a genre impacts a story but also a compelling story is told in the genre that fits it best and that's really hard to talk about because you just never know but sometimes if you're wondering like okay this this story isn't really doing the thing that it needs to do for me. Maybe it's that it's not being told in a style that is compatible with the, the story that's being told, right? Um, another element is clarity and cohesion. Uh, you know, this is where for me as an editor, um, sometimes I'll, I'll get a piece or I'll be writing a piece myself and I'll say, all of these different parts of this story are really compelling. All of them work, but they don't work together. So this is where, you know, you kind of try to figure out what is interrupting the flow? Why is it that this isn't making sense? What about this is it is disjointed? And sometimes you're able to do it for your own story and sometimes you're not. Sometimes you're like, well, it makes sense to me. Yeah, because you wrote it. So you're, you know, fully in it and you have to have someone else come back and be like, okay, well, these parts make sense and these don't. You know, I have you know, as recently in the last two weeks, have someone had someone who helped me through that and helped me in a story that, um, you know, helped me make it just a little bit more, you know, make just, help it make just a little bit more sense, right? Words. Um, they are my job. Sometimes I still can't speak them. Um, another element is emotional payoff. Um, so, I, you know, this might not be resonant with everyone, but, um, you know, Game of Thrones uh, is a big, example of how not to do emotional payoff correctly. Um, there are any number of reasons why a story might not give you kind of that satisfaction at the end of finishing it. Um, some of them are just because you were rooting for one character and the character didn't win out and like it could still be a really good story but you personally just don't like it and so it didn't give you emotional payoff. Other times it could be that things were rushed um, and don't really make sense and I think in that case you know the Game of Thrones uh, example um, really models that and that um, I think a lot of people it was less that, you know, the ending of it, and I know that I'm, you know, I don't want to go too deep in this, but the ending of it didn't make sense, not because it didn't theoretically make sense, but because the pacing of it didn't make sense. So I know I'm kind of being very vague. Um, this is, you know, I'm trying to do two things at once. This is, so this is not like a full on in depth, how to tell a good story workshop, because I need to get to the conflict transformative piece. But again, we can talk about any, any number of these elements a little bit later on as well. Um, world building that speaks to the, to us. And what I mean here is that, you know, there might be a trope that you like. And so a trope is, right, like, let's say you've got a character, you've got two characters and they're enemies, but by the end, you know, they've fallen in love. That's a trope. Enemies to, to, to lovers is what they call it. You could have lovers to enemies. That's another trope. You know, um, sister relationships, brother relationships, sibling relationships, generally, that's a trope, right? So, you know, you will personally have a trope that you like and that can make a story very compelling for you. Uh, another uh, element of this is cultural touchstones, right? So um, 
maybe, you know, your background uh, is in, you know, like just, to, you know, um, you have a, an academic background in a certain area. And so any story that kind of pulls in elements of that, you're, you might be more likely to like that. Or in terms of, um, and this is a broader discussion going on now in publishing of representation, right? You are able to see yourself in the story. And one of, the, and we'll get to this a little bit more later, but you know, one of the big issues is what happens if you're not able to see yourself in stories, right? What happens if all of the stories that you have access to, all of the books that are being published, are stories that are about people who don't have experiences that resonate with you or experiences that are your experiences, for example, you know, um, this could be because the, the characters are um, a different race than you, the characters are a different religion than you. Um, and it's not that those are bad stories, right? And it's not that you don't like those stories. It's just that, you know, maybe sometimes you want a story where, you know, you, someone who looks like you, someone who uh, has the experiences that you have is the main character. So that can make stories compelling as well. But in here too, it's also world building that's cohesive. So again, this goes a little bit back to the clarity and cohesion. You know, an element of the story that has, you know, been built makes sense for the world that you are describing, right? And so fantasy is where you might hear the word world building a lot because you're creating, you know, maybe you're creating new languages or you're creating languages based on existing languages and things like that. And so they, they make sense. But sometimes um, if, if it's not done well, it might make the story less compelling because instead of putting the reader in a world that is very immersive for them and that kind of has a good flow, what happens is that the, the, the world feels off in some way. Um, and finally, you know, creativity is another element of this, it's that, you know, it's, it's that thing where, you know, you've got kind of a traditional medium, for example, but you're using it in a different way, right? Um, and by medium, what I, what I mean is like, okay, a written medium, like a, an, you know, a, a long form article or a novel or, you know, a visual medium, like, you know, an, an art exhibition or a video or things like that. So seeing things done in a way that might be innovative, um, that kind of creativity, the thing that, you know, you, the storyteller does something that you weren't quite expecting, that can make a story very compelling as well. Um, and I guess my last note on this would be, again, just that all of this is personal. You know, what's compelling to me might not be compelling to you. I think that there are certain things that, there are certain um, elements that you can try to incorporate in every single story. Again, I think stakes is one of them, matching the genre in, in a way that it, it makes sense, you know, it makes sense for this story to be a fantasy. It makes sense for this story to be a comedy. It makes sense for this story to be a tragedy, right? Um, and that can be the question you could ask when you're telling a story. Okay, this doesn't feel quite right. Maybe I'm not in the right genre. Um, clarity and cohesion and things like that. But things like, you know, cultural touchstones, you know, um, you might be telling a story that resonates with someone and doesn't resonate with another person. That doesn't make it a bad story. It just makes it a story that fits for one person and doesn't fit for another person. So again, in the chat, if you want to talk a little bit um, about, I, I'm just curious about this, like, uh, let me go back. Um, what are some stories that resonate with you? Um, uh, if you, if just anything, you know, a book, a television show, you know, a cultural moment, I don't know, comes to mind and you want to share it with people, please do put that in the chat. I just think that would be kind of interesting. Um, but while you do that, I'm going to go ahead and play uh, a clip for you all. And this is where we're going to get to a participant participatory part of the uh, workshop. Um, and I will kind of figure out, I'll let you watch the clip. It's about a few minutes long. Um, in the meantime, I'll figure out if I actually want to do breakout groups or not. Um, so you all just kind of, you know, uh, pay attention to the story that I'm about to play. Um, and, I, you know, we're going to go to a discussion. And these are the three questions that I want you all to discuss. And I'm telling you them now so that you can listen to the story with these in mind. But basically, I want you to figure out if this is a good story, aka a compelling story to you, um, specifically. Uh, if you think it's a compelling story, then think about, okay, what is it that is compelling to you? If you think it's a not a compelling story to you, then, you know, why is that? But also, what do you think could make it more compelling? And I'm just, there's no right answers here, right? I'm, I have my own view on it, but I'm really curious to see what everyone else's view is. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Um, and thank you. Oh, yeah, Lovecraft Country. I have not watched that yet, and I really do want to. Um, so I'm going to go to the video, um, and then I'm going to play it. So let me go ahead and share the screen. And we have 12 people. Yeah, I think I'll do breakout groups probably, but we'll find out. 
Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share this video. And I'm gonna make it full screen. If you can't hear anything or, or something like that, let me know, like, and put, um, put your video on so that I can know because I can't really see the chat right now. Or not video, your, your audio on. But um, if not, I'm gonna go ahead and, am I in the right place? I hope I am. Being said, September 17th, just uh, uh, less than a month ago, was the 40th anniversary of the Camp David Accords. It is, in my opinion, and Harold Saunders was a vital part of this, the greatest diplomatic personal achievement of any president of the United States ever, more than Woodrow Wilson with the Paris Agreement in World War I. Carter poured over intelligence records on Prime Minister Begin of Israel and Anwar Sadat of Egypt to understand their character, to understand their red lines, what could they not go beyond, how far could they be pushed. And then through 13 agonizing days and nights at the presidential retreat in the Catoctin Mountains in Camp David, he personally drafted over 20 separate peace agreements and negotiated separately with Begin and Sadat and their teams because they were like two scorpions in the bottle. They so distrusted each other. The first night of those 13 days, we put them together. It was a catastrophe. Never again. And had they been together, it would have ended a lot earlier. And Carter added two personal touches. The first Sunday of the 13 days, he took Begin and Sadat in his presidential limousine, and he said, no negotiations, we're not negotiating. I want you to see the Gettysburg battlefield. And he took them on a tour of the battlefield to underscore what five wars between Egypt and Israel had meant and lost lives since 1948 when Israel was created. And it had an amazing effect. I mean, Sadat was a military man, a general, and he began to expound on the mistakes that Pickett made in Pickett's last charge for the Confederacy. Begin was anything but a military man, but he extemporaneously on the battlefield read and enunciated Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Very, very emotional. Okay, so we come to the last Sunday, the 13th day, we're close, but we still don't have an agreement. And Begin says to Carter, Mr. President, I'm out of here. I cannot make any more concessions. It's not a bluff. I've got an LL plane waiting at Andrews Air Force Base. Get a White House car and take me out of here. He called it a glorified concentration camp. I cannot go any further. Carter realizing this would totally undermine Anwar Sadat's historic trip to Israel in which he declared no more wars. It would inflame the Middle East and further radicalize it could cost Sadat his life and Carter his presidency, came up with another personal touch. Knowing Begin's love for his eight grandchildren, he got each of their names and he had eight photographs made, copies of himself, Begin and Sadat at Camp David, personally inscribed each of the names of the grandchildren, walked over to Begin's cabin, hand delivered it to Begin and watched as he went through and vocalized the names of each of the grandchildren with blessings for peace by the president. Carter saw Begin's lips quiver, his eyes tear, and he put his bags down and he said, Mr. President, I'll make one last try. The rest is history. 40 years later, never one violation of that agreement. It's central to Israel's security and to our national interests in the region as well. Right, so that was that video. Um, I'm just realizing that right before I went in, I said there are no right answers. I am nervous. I mean, there are no wrong answers. Um, though, you know, we could just say there are no right answers and this would be a whole other type of workshop. But um, what I'm going to try to do um, is I'm trying to see, I might split us up into two breakout groups. Um, and I've never done this before, so I would like everyone to uh, just hold on for a second to see if I do this correct correctly. Um, and 
I'm gonna do that. And then what I'm gonna have you all do basically is I'm gonna put, again, put up the, the words, the questions that I want you all to consider. Again, what makes this a compelling story for you if it is a compelling story? Um, and then if it's not a compelling story, what could make it a little bit more compelling? Um, and I'm not sure. no, actually, you know, we have uh, only a few people on this call. So I'm not, I'm not gonna do breakout. I think I'm just gonna have everyone chat in here. I would love to hear from you all. You can put it in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll put this up again, the PowerPoint. Um, so here that is again. Um, you can see what the, uh, you know, what these questions are. I would like to see us start discussing what what your answers are to this. So you can put it in the chat. Um, let me make sure I pop out the chat real fast so that I can see it. This is where I'm running into, I don't know how to use Zoom very well. I'm gonna go ahead and make sure. The problem is I can't see the chat. Does anyone want, does anyone, does anyone have any thoughts? You can go ahead, you can speak. Who is this? Who's unmuted? I, I could say something. I'm, this is Mary yes. Kate. Hi, Mary um, Kate, please. I, I, something that was compelling from the beginning for me was, uh, and he just framed the story as like, this is the most important piece of um, peace building that a president has done. Mm -hmm. And he was like, ever. So that yeah. already had me like, okay, why? Um, so he started with a really bold statement like that. And then I think just the um, emotional stakes, so bringing in people's families and um, that was compelling to me as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm just kind of typing those down. You'll probably hear me typing them down because I'm just I'm curious, I wanna keep some notes. Maybe we can reflect on them a little bit later. Um, more, anyone else have any? Any thoughts about what was compelling? Or, or and also, if you didn't think it was very compelling at all, I would love to hear because I I personally think it's it's compelling. But I would be very curious to hear if, if anyone doesn't think it's that compelling or that it could be more compelling, and if so, how? I think um, this is Emily. Hey, Emily, um, the personal details make it really compelling um, mm -hmm. because you get to know the characters, which I'm putting in. Yeah, because these are real people, um, but just you know, having understanding them more, and it could have been even more compelling, I think, with even more of this detail. Um, so you kind of connect to motivations, and it helps build empathy. I think that's great. Thank you, Emily. Yeah. Um, you get a, you do, you get like, right, like you get a sense of who the three characters are in this telling of it. It's right, it's uh, President Carter, it is um, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat, and it is uh, Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin. Um, so you've, you've got that sense um, of who they are. And then the, you've got some, you know, uh, other characters who are kind of, you know, they're not necessarily actors in this story, so to speak, but they are re referred to, uh, you know, the namely the eight grandchildren, right, of Bacon, and that being a deciding factor. It, does, is there anyone else who had any thoughts on, um, you know, whether it was compelling, why it was compelling, why it might not have been so compelling? Um, and if you don't want to speak, you can also put it in the chat as well, but um, yeah. Anyone else? I'm gonna make sure that I can see participants in case anyone's hands are raising. Um, Hello. Hi. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, in my case, unfortunately, it was from my perspective, it was not a compelling story. Yeah. For for the beginning, and also for a piece of the of the end. At the end, um, when the person started saying that this is the most, when I he sometimes when I hear that, and especially in, in in the peace and conflict resolution field, yeah. For me, it, it's kind of a a, a way to put it everything not in a scientific effort, but in a personal effort. And more, for me, it's, it's going to be more related with, with a personal 
ego. Mm -hmm. So that that is something that when I that is kind of a, a trigger for me actually. I will call it like that. When someone will start speaking in that way, for me it's just a trigger. Yeah. And also at the end, I don't know if I misunderstood or I, I didn't hear well, but when when the person said at the end, and this was good also for our national interest. Mm -hmm. If that is what he said, I will. That was also another trigger for me, because for me, uh, when I when I see the field of peace of conflict resolution, it's not about a national interest. That's for me. It sounds like colonizing something, like imperialism or something like that. It's it's a, it's a narrative that I, I strongly disagree. So for mm -hmm. those two reasons, it's something. Yeah. Also, uh, let me add something more. Yep. Even though the personal example of the personal touches that he mentions yeah. are, are specific and maybe important, I would say, how can you translate that into education and other um, peace and conflict resolution practitioners? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what I'm trying to say is, if you are not the same person with those, those personal touches mm -hmm. or those uh, personal charismas, how can you practice the field? Because only that person was able to make, for example, to use the picture and, and everything like that. It's something so personal that is not, it's, it's not a technology that you can translate right. to other people in the field. Right. So for those reasons, I would, I would say from my perspective, that is not a compelling uh, story. It's, it's just only my personal reaction to that. That is, that's really fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, that is actually a perfect, a perfect segue into where we're going to go next, which is um, kind of transitioning away from um, what makes the story compelling to what makes the story conflict transformative. Um, and again, I've taken these notes and I'm going to uh, find a way to share it with everyone who's on this call as well. So um, I, I just want to note that there. Um, but yeah, thank you to all of you for those reflections. I am getting personally very excited about them. Um, and I think that, you know, especially for me, some of the things that I find compelling about it, like the personal touches, to hear that, um, you know, uh, that that isn't compelling for everyone, that's really fascinating to me. And I think that's where, you know, again, I want to bring in some of this nuance about, you know, storytelling is also a very personal thing, right? What works for one person is not going to work for another. So I'm going to expand upon that a little bit. Um, so I'm going to go back to these slides. Um, and we're going to go to our transition. Basically, um, what I want to say here is, what I want to ma make clear and what is obvious here is that storytelling is not purely a positive thing, right? It is not purely a, to put it very, very simply, um, a force for good, right? Um, we are surrounded by storytelling all the time. We do storytelling all the time. And, and you know, and the, I'm using storytelling here in some ways kind of as a, a a stand-in for um, narrative, which, you know, if I had more time, I would go into a discussion of why that's not necessarily, you know, they're not one-on-one, -on -one, you know, they're not one-for-one -one, um, synonyms of each other. But basically, we, we are always storifying the wor world around us. We are always storifying ourselves. Um, and for that reason, you know, it's not that, you know, storytelling is a tool, but it's not a tool that's only going to lead to, um, you know, a more peaceful world or a more just world or a more equitable world, right? So storytelling's compelling stories specifically has the power to escalate a conflict, right? To, you know, if, if you have a specific story about how something happened and then the person you're talking to or fighting with had um, another story about what happened and those stories do not, like there's no room for those stories to come together. Like you, you know, you two can be in modes that the way you tell those stories actually escalates the conflict between you, right? And that, that works for interpersonal, in, you know, interpersonal relationships. It works for, um, you know, relationships with, between groups, relationships between countries, um, the, you know, the stories will clash. And so that becomes a conflict. Um, I even don't like to use the word clash because that has, you know, if you know IR theory and the clash of civilizations, that I, that is a whole discourse that is its own story, but we're not going to go there. Um, but stories also have the power to de-escalate conflict. So think about, you know, if someone is, if it's clear that someone is um, in a mode of storytelling that is very, again, it, 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 it kind of gets your, your, you know, your blood boiling a little bit, or, you know, for, for good or bad reasons, you know, you're feeling very energized by it. Um, and that energy is starting to go towards a, you know, starting to drive that conflict towards potentially, um, you know, contention or heaven forbid, violence, you know, things like that. 
there are ways of telling stories that can also de-escalate the conflict. We'll talk a little bit about that more. Um, stories can foment violent or violence or oppression. Stories can center calls for justice. They can also be used to prevent violence. They can create negative peace. And here, you know, this is also a whole other discussion, but basically negative peace is, you know, okay, there's not violence between the two parties per se, right? There's not like, you know, people aren't shooting each other. People aren't, you know, um, like physically fighting with, with each other. But that doesn't mean that the society is necessarily at peace, right? You can still have structures that dehumanize. You can still have structures that oppress. Some communities might have more rights than others, things like that, right? So just because you're not in an active, you know, violent war zone doesn't mean you're technically at peace, right? So that's negative peace. And this is a, you know, I'm, we, again, this is a very simple explanation of it, but, um, and then positive peace um, incorporates more, okay, yes, we don't have violence, but also do we have justice? Do we have laws that apply equally to everyone? Do we, you know, do um, communities, all, all communities have, have rights? And do some communities, for example, um, that have experienced oppression, you know, is the, you know, narrative turned towards, you know, fixing that oppression, right? Like, you know, there, there are a lot of different ways that uh, peace can be positive, but basically it, it needs to center ideas of justice and equity. It's not just about, okay, we're not fighting in the streets. Um, uh, it's about, we're not fighting in the streets and we've, you know, we've got structures in place that actually um, allow us to uh, have justice and equality for all communities. Um, so basically, as we transition, um, I want to say that if stories have power, that also means storytellers have power. Um, and I, I'm saying that because I want to kind of get into our minds this idea of sometimes it feels like the stories can speak us, right? Sometimes it feels like the narrative is taking us along with it. And I think that's really important to understand that you might be speaking a story that's really speaking you um, because you don't fully appreciate where that story is coming from. Um, but you also have the ability as a storyteller to then recognize that, to analyze when the story is speaking you, and then make decisions about what story you're going to tell next, right? So storytelling has power and the storytellers also have power. So in the chat, if you want to talk a little bit about, you know, when you hear the word storyteller, who comes to mind, that would be very interesting to me as well to see, um, you know, what you're, you're all thinking about. But I'm going to go ahead and go to the second part of our workshop, which is telling conflict transformative stories. So um, this is where, you know, I really want us to get into, you know, to kind of transition a little bit from the mode of what is a compelling story to what is a conflict transformative story. Um, and then to my previous question, Emily says when she thinks of storytellers, she thinks of grandparents, and I completely agree. And also, I think my grandmother might be on this call. So shout out to Jo, um, uh, <laughs> who is the ultimate storyteller. Um, so here, you know, we're talking about not just compelling stories, but also how do you tell a story that is conflict transformative? And what I mean by this is a story that's going to help to transform the conflict from destructive conflict, you know, conflict that breaks down relationships, conflict that leads to death, right? Conflict that leads to oppression to, you know, a conflict environment that's like healthy conflict, right? Because we're not going to be in a conflict neutral zone ever, right? We're never going to be in a world without conflict. It wouldn't be very interesting that way, right? You wouldn't have an interesting story if you didn't have the conflict stakes. But, you know, that doesn't mean conflict has to be destructive. It can be healthy. It can make relationships stronger, you know, and, you know, it can be conflict that doesn't lead to, you know, rights abuses, killing and, and things of that sort. Um, so I want to say a little bit about why I say conflict transformative versus conflict sensitive. Uh, the reasoning for that, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm still thinking about this, but conflict sensitive to me feels a little bit passive, feels like this, the sense of the storyteller is outside the conflict, right? That, this, that the story is not the conflict, that the story is simply telling the conflict, being a representation of the conflict. Not that that's a bad thing. Conflict sensitive would be telling a story in such a way as you are careful not to exacerbate the conflict, right? That's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's a good thing. Um, but I, I don't say conflict sensitive because I think what I really want to kind of emphasize here is that conflict is this, you know, story is the site of conflict, right? Like story is the way that we do conflict. Um, you know, when you have a conflict between yourself and a parent, for example, you will have your story about everything that feeds into that conflict, and they will have their story about everything that feeds into that conflict. Or when you have two communities, right? And in this case, uh, we'll pull on my thesis research, like when you have um, the Turkish community, which is itself made up of all different types of people who have different stories about what it means to be Turkish. And then the Kurdish community, 
who themselves, again, each single Kurdish person has a story about what it means to be Kurdish that is rooted in their own personal experiences, right, as well as their group experiences. Um, you know, their stories will be the site of, con they, they will tell stories about the conflict between them, or hopefully, you know, where there isn't conflict between those two groups, right? Um, so that's why I say conflict transformative, because I want to get into mind that storytelling is a way that we do conflict, and it's also a way that we do conflict resolution, or in this case, conflict transformation, again, from destructive conflict toward, towards a space where it, the conflict is more healthy. Um, so I want to go over a little bit the, the you know, the theories uh, that kind of feed into this specific intersection of um, narrative and conflict resolution. This is not exhaustive, obviously, and you'll see that it is very much rooted in um, the faculty members here at our school. Um, so I, I want to say that in the sense of this, think of this as a start. And if you're curious, um, I'd be happy to, you know, talk more with you about it um, and hear more, you know, whichever resources you have as well. Um, but basically, you know, I want to break this down um, a little bit into, um, you know, starting with personal identity. So our personal identities, um, I mean, the ways that we think of ourselves are defined by the stories that we tell about ourselves. And I think here, what's important to say too, is that you don't have an identi identity that's just one thing, right? Like if I, Audrey Williams, want to talk about my identity, I might sometimes talk about how I'm from Iowa. And then other times I might talk about how I am white. Or other times I might talk about how I grew up middle class. And then other times I might say, okay, well, I was a dancer, so that's my identity. Or other times I'll say, okay, I'm Muslim, so that's my identity, right? And all of these things are my identity and they come together in a story that is uniquely my own. Um, so I can define myself by the story I tell about myself. But unfortunately, we're also not in a vacuum, right? Or I, I don't think unfortunately is the right word here, but like we're not inside a vacuum, right? So our identities are also defined by the stories that people tell about us. People who know us personally, people who do not know us personally, right? So I will have a story about what it means to be Muslim, not just because of what I specifically have experienced being Muslim, but also what my government might say it means to be Muslim or what my colleagues might say it means to be Muslim, even if they don't think that they're talking about what it means to be Muslim, right? Or I might tell stories about people that, um, you know, uh, are, you know, come from my position as um, someone who is white, right? So my view of what it means to be um, someone who is black is not going to come from my own lived experience and then my stories will impact them in a way that you know regardless of whether I intend any harm or not might be harmful right and so I think that that's what I kind of want to get into play is that we are defined by the stories we tell about ourselves but also about the stories that we that we tell about others and about that um, that uh, people tell about us so this is very much the personal identity um, if you move it out broadly you'll get to social identity so again that's you know here I am Audrey um, you know, uh, white American Muslim, right? My broader community might be white people. My, my broader social identity, right, might be white people. My broader social identity might be American people. My broader social identity might be Muslim people. And then we're getting into, okay, what are the narratives that we use to demarcate the boundaries between those? And this is where it's very important, again, to remember that, you know, we will use boundaries to de demarcate, and then all of these different types of narratives coexist, coexist together with us or clash within us. Um, but basically we'll use those narratives to say, okay, I am, you know, this thing and they are that thing. And that's, that's what makes them, you know, um, you know, a group that I am not versus this is what makes me the group that I am, right, that I belong to. And this is, this is really, really, again, kind of bare bones, uh, a look at this. But basically, um, you know, we, just as we tell stories about ourselves, we tell stories about our broader groups and we will use narratives about what it means to be American, narratives about what it means to be Muslim, right? Narratives about what it means to be white. Um, and my narrative about what it means to be white will be very different than another white person's narrative about what it means to be white, right? To draw boundaries between, um, you know, other people, groups. And this doesn't necessarily have to be like a, a conflictual thing, but often the way that we do it is in such a way that it otherizes, right? So it makes that other group you know, not just different, but also different in a way that is uncomfortable, right? Or, you know, well, we are, you know, and this is where conflict comes in. The, the kinds of stories that create these kinds of conflicts, these unhealthy conflicts between groups are the stories that say, well, my group is, you know, um, pure, or my group never, you know, can't do any wrong, or my group is this, or my group is that. Um, and their group is, 
you know, um, threatening and, and, you know, their group is criminal and their group is deviant. And that's why what happens to them happens to them, right? And that is how we get stories that create conflict. So how do we, you know, how do we not do that, right? How do we still exist in a world where we, we're going to have identities and we're going to have, you know, social group boundaries? Um, but how do we do that in such a way that, you know, it's not going to exacerbate and escalate conflicts um, or not exacerbate and escalate conflict towards destruction um, for no reason? And that's, gonna, that's, a, that's an interesting point that's going to, I'm going to come to at the very end of this section. But basically, um, you know, to begin, you know, the ways that we tell better stories, this is what Sarah Cobbs, you know, calls better stories, right, is introducing complexity. So again, instead of, you know, looking at me and saying, okay, that is a person who's wearing a headscarf, so she's Muslim. Okay, yeah, I'm Muslim, and I am also white, and I am also um, from Iowa, and I'm also a dancer, and I'm also middle class, and I also really, really like storytelling, and I also don't really like math, you know? So, um, and sometimes I make mistakes, and sometimes I don't. You know, that's complexity, right? I mean, again, this is very, very simple version of complexity, but, you know, you introduce that, right? So instead of saying, well, um, you know, that group only does this, you say, okay, some people in that group do this sometimes, right? And then other times those same people do something else, you know? So some people in that group might be engaged in violent conflict, right? But they're also you know, they also have siblings and they also care about their mom and they, you know, things like that. You introduce, you know, it, and it, it sounds really common sense, but it's really, you know, sometimes very hard to do. And, but basically, you know, what, what Sarah Cobb is, is introducing is this idea of, um, uh, and not introducing necessarily, like, you know, she's also built upon um, the literature, but in the conflict space is that if you want to get to a place of conflict resolution, you have to introduce more complex stories about the conflict parties. Right. Um, now, the very last point I want to make, and I think this is, this is the point where, that's really fascinating to me, um, uh, and I think that I, you know, want to do more research on, is what kinds of stories do you tell when? So, um, generally speaking, I think we should be moving towards more complex stories. But I think it's important to also understand that the time might not always be right for a complex story, right? Um, and so that, you know, the, the, the question that's hanging over me here is, you know, who gets to be complex, first of all, and also, when do you get to be complex? And when is it important for someone to be complex? And when is it important for the, the conflict to be described in a way that's more clear, right? And not simple, clear. And this is what um, Solon Simmons introduces uh, at the end of his uh, most recent book, Root Narrative Theory, is this idea of moral clarity and moral complexity. Moral clarity is this idea that, you know, you've got a story that is, you know, it's very linear. It's like this thing happened and this thing resulted. Um, and, you know, you're really focused in on, okay, you know, these are the very, um, you know, the basic causes of something. And um, we have to focus in on that before we can focus in on the broader issues, right? So let's say, you know, um, you've got a story where you're talking about um, right the the you know right now, which is a, you know a, a big conversation in the United States, racial justice, right? So a morally clear story, clear story would be, well, you know, we have to focus in on getting, you know, on on getting um, uh, well, on getting rid of police brutality, right? Like, and and not really deviating far, you know, not that you can't bring in certain nuances, but the through line, the narrative through line, is that. I mean, defund the police, right, is a morally clear story. I'm not gonna make, right here, right now, I, personally, I have my own opinions, um, but right here, right now, I'm not gonna say, you know, it's, it's a good story or a bad story or, or whatever. It's just a morally clear story. It's, you know, defund the police is, it's very obvious what the point of that is. And so a morally clear approach to that would be really honing in on that and not kind of moving away from that, that through line, right? There are times when that might seem to be the right move. And what I'm very interested in is how do you know when those times are? I, I don't have an answer to that, unfortunately. Um, but what I mean by this is that um, there are times when you kind of have to use narrative to escalate a conflict in order to get to a point where you de-escalate. De and this kind of introduces the concept, which um, a lot of people in conflict resolution, the conflict resolution field might be familiar with, that you know conflicts are not straight lines. You don't go just from you know conflict to resolution 
without any back and forth. Um, it might be nice if that was the case, but that is not the case. Sometimes you go forward and then sometimes you have to circle backward and then you have to go forward again. And this can be very complex, right? And, and very troubling sometimes when you see that, um, you know, uh, you might have to escalate a conflict and, you know, get the tempers rising and, and get people um, kind of on more clear narrative sides before you can actually get people to the table to then have um, that and then introduce that complexity. I know I'm being very vague right now, but um, what I'm saying here is that uh, I think it's important to remember in when we're talking about narrative and conflict that just the way that conflict resolution is a process, narrative is also a process. The minute you put a narrative out in the world, it is subject to be changed, right? And the narrative will change over time, right? So if I tell you, and like, to, I mean, the best way to think about this is telephone, right? Like, if I tell you a story, then you're going to tell that story to someone else, but it might just be slightly different, right? Well, it will just be slightly different. You're not going to use the exact same words unless you have a photographic memory, in which case that's cool, but I don't. Um, so you're going to tell it a little bit differently, and then the next person's going to tell it a little bit differently, and then it, you know, it, it expands, it, it becomes a different sort of story. So I think that's what's important to remember here is that um, storytelling is an iterative process, and um, you might not always want to introduce complexity given your analysis of where the conflict is. And then, you know, the other thing is, is that you're always gonna ha have to, you're, you're gonna only find out in the aftermath whether that was the right move or not, right? Um, you might decide that the time is right to escalate the conflict in order to get it to a point where you can de-escalate it and that was the wrong move. And you're not gonna find out until afterwards. Or it was the wrong move for now, but then maybe a few years on, it's gonna be the right move, right? So um, I don't have a lot of, um, uh, you know, firm answers on how you do this, because I don't really know how to do it. And I'm, I'm really excited about learning a little bit more about that. But I wanted to introduce some of these concepts. Um, and now, as I've introduced these concepts, I want you all, we're going to go to the second part, the second participatory part of this. Um, I want you all to revisit this clip. I'm going to play it again. Um, and this time, instead of thinking about, okay, is the story compelling or not? And I think this is where we're going to get to um, Harvey's comments about, you know, okay, the elements that might, you know, th these elements here were a trigger for me, like, the, and made it less compelling for me. And, um, you know, uh, I, I, I think that this is where we, we get to that point, is that, um, you know, I want you to talk about, is this a conflict transformative story? Based on, you know, what you've learned here, and also what you might already know about storytelling, some of you. Um, and what I mean by that is kind of think about, you know, what elements might be morally clear in this story? What elements might be morally complex? Um, and I know that I, I, I haven't introduced the full, like, diagram to you, so I, I understand that, I, you know, not everything, um, if, if you have any questions, if it's, if it's unclear to you, uh, just let me know. But basically, you know, what elements do you think might escalate the conflict or escalate a conflict? What elements do you think might de-escalate? A conflict. Again, I want you to start thinking about the story as the site of conflict, not just as a representation of conflict, but as part and parcel of the conflict. And here, I would say the conflict is, you know, um, the, the conflict between Israel and Egypt uh, that resulted in this peace treaty um, the, and the relationship that is ongoing and certainly not, only not, it's not non-conflictual, it's just, it's at a different stage of the conflict. Uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, Palestinian-Israeli conflict. I mean, think a little bit about, okay, who do we put first? Which group do we put first? What does that mean, right? Um, so look at, you know, again, the elements that are clear, the elements that are complex. Also listen to the silences. Who's missing from this story? Um, and I really want you to think about that. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and play this again. Um, and uh, we're gonna do this. Um, Real security. Oh no and to oh. our national interests in the region as well. Started playing too soon. Okay, so I'm getting it back to the point. Um, and I'm just playing it again. You might still remember a little bit of it, but I really want you to listen into it again and listen a little closely with kind of these conflict transformative elements in mind. So I am gonna go ahead and stop sharing and now instead share this. Oh no! I know where it is, don't worry. Okay, 
So I'm going to play this again. So again, think about the conflict transformative elements or what, you know, just reflect on what you might be thinking about the story now that we've kind of go, gone over some of that. Peace agreements and negotiated set. No, I didn't go far back enough. Sorry, just a second. <laughs> okay. Abroad, his accomplishments were equally dramatic. As the Dean said, September 17th, just uh, uh, less than a month ago, was the 40th anniversary of the Camp David Accords. It is, in my opinion, and Hal Saunders was a vital part of this, the greatest diplomatic personal achievement of any president of the United States ever, more than Woodrow Wilson with the Paris Agreement in World War I. Carter poured over intelligence records on Prime Minister Begin of Israel and Anwar Sadat of Egypt to understand their character, to understand their red lines, what could they not go beyond, how far could they be pushed. And then through 13 agonizing days and nights at the presidential retreat in the Catoctin Mountains in Camp David, he personally drafted over 20 separate peace agreements and negotiated separately with Begin and Sadat and their teams because they were like two scorpions in the bottle. They so distrusted each other. The first night of those 13 days, we put them together. It was a catastrophe. Never again. And had they been together, it would have ended a lot earlier. And Carter added two personal touches. The first Sunday of the 13 days, he took Begin and Sadat in his presidential limousine, and he said, no negotiations, we're not negotiating. I want you to see the Gettysburg battlefield. And he took them on a tour of the battlefield to underscore what five wars between Egypt and Israel had meant and lost lives since 1948 when Israel was created. And it had an amazing effect. I mean. Sadat was a military man, a general, and he began to expound on the mistakes that Pickett made in Pickett's last charge for the Confederacy. Begin was anything but a military man, but he extemporaneously on the battlefield read and enunciated Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Very, very emotional. Okay, so we come to the last Sunday, the 13th day. We're close, but we still don't have an agreement. And Begin says to Carter, Mr. President, I'm out of here. I cannot make any more concessions. It's not a bluff. I've got an LL plane waiting at Andrews Air Force Base. Get a White House car and take me out of here. He called it a glorified concentration camp. I cannot go any further. Carter realizing this would totally undermine Anwar Sadat's historic trip to Israel in which he declared no more wars. It would inflame the Middle East and further radicalize it, could cost Sadat his life and Carter his presidency, came up with another personal touch. Knowing Begin's love for his eight grandchildren, he got each of their names and he had eight photographs made, copies of himself, Begin and Sadat at Camp David, personally inscribed each of the names of the grandchildren walked over to Begin's cabin, hand-delivered it to Begin, and watched as he went through and vocalized the names of each of the grandchildren with blessings for peace by the president. Carter saw Begin's lips quiver, his eyes tear, and he put his bags down and he said, Mr. President, I'll make one last try. The rest is history. 40 years later, never one violation of that agreement. It's central to Israel's security and to our national interests in the region as well. All right. So I'm going to put the questions up again that I want us to reflect on. And I didn't share my screen, so I'm going to do this. Just a moment. So I'm going to do this. All right. So um, now that we've watched that again, now that we've talked a little bit about conflict transformative stories, AKA I went through that really fast. And so I apologize if 
things might still be unclear. And if you have any questions, happy to chat more about it. But, um, you know, with, with those, uh, you know, with what we've, we've done now and discussed now, um, you know, what are some elements that you think, you know, just kind of intersect with, with conflict here? What, you know, what are some elements that you think might be more morally clear? Um, what are some elements you think might be more morally complex? And then, you know, what are some silences that you think you might be hearing? Um, anyone who wants to go ahead and unmute and chat or put it in the chat too, you can. If I may. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, please. This is Harvey again. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, well, I, thank you again for playing the, the video. I would like to share a, a couple of comments about the first question. Is this mm -hmm. a conflict transformative story? Mm -hmm. I would say no. And for these reasons, I was taking notes on that. In the first part of the video, the person said, I'm sorry that I didn't, I don't remember the, the name of the, the oh. person. But he, he said that this was a quotation, a personal achievement on one person. So for me, transformative, uh, conflict transformation is not about the personal achievement of the mediator of the negotiator of the third party. Con uh, conflict transformation is about the parties. I mean, the two countries that were in that negotiation. So that's one point. The second one, he said that he, I mean, referring to the, to the negotiator or the third party, he understood the characters of the, of, the, of the people, of the parties that were negotiating. And again, conflict transformation is not only knowing or claiming that you know the characters and the personalities and et cetera, but that the parties understand to each other, that the parties build a common understanding from, from their perspective, not from the perspective of the third party. So that is a second reason that that is not a confl conflict transformative narrative. The third one, he said they were negotiating in 13 agonizing days. So that is a description of how the process was. However, until the last day, they, did, they didn't reach an agreement. So from my perspective, they were not doing a, a conflict transformation process because they were not changing the stories and the narratives of the parties because he, he described 13 days of agony and just at the last kind of minute, they reached an agreement. Another argument in that side is that the negotiations were in, uh, separated. Not in, not in, I mean in caucus separated, but not in, in, in the same room. That for me, for a conflict uh, transformation narrative perspective, it should be a midst of uh, uh, caucus separation, I mean separated meetings, but also in order to build trust, they have to be together. And that is another thing that I would like to highlight. He said very clearly that the parties didn't trust each other to each other. So how can be a, a, a story, a transformative story, if we didn't build trust between the people? Another thing, and, and now the last, the last part uh, that I will say is that in the first example of the personal touch, he, from, from my understanding, when he was showing, I mean, the, the, the things in the battlefield, for me, for me, it sounds like, um, a moral lesson from a third party with authority. I mean, I will show you what you shouldn't do. I will show you the catastrophe of this war, but it's not something that I will show you. It's something that I will prefer that the parties will reflect, analyze, and come to a conclusion, not because I am showing them, but because they understood that. The second example, of course, was all me about them the personal touch that for me, when he said, the person that he was talking about, he said, I will not make no one more concession. For me, that is part of the narrative of the problem solving, linear, I mean, uh, a traditional way of, of uh, uh, negotiation, but not a conflict transformation uh, word to use when you, when you see that the process is about concessions and not mutual understanding, for example. At the end, just, this is my last part, I would say that this, this is not for me a conflict transformation story because he said 
And after the agreement, there were no violations of the agreement. But however, a conflict transformative story for me is the stories that people that were in conflict will tell in the aftermath. Not the person who made the agreement. Not that they, agreement is one thing, it's something that you write in a paper, it's something that you, you have an agreement with someone, somebody else, but a conflict transformative story for me is the story that very, in a very long time, people, the, the, the same one that, that were fighting to each other, will tell about how they see to each other, how they understand to each other, how they build a new, an alternative or better form a story, how they are reconciliating, reconciliating to each other. So I'm sorry it took too long, but I would like to, those, to make those comments. Don't apologize. No, don't apologize. That was amazing. Thank you. Okay. I've, I've, again, I've taken notes. Um, I will. I, I will share them with everyone who has, um, you know, I'll, tr I'll, I'll figure out a way to share them with everyone. Um, that was amazing. Um, I have a lot of like, I have a lot of thoughts on that too, that I would, I, that I would like to kind of follow up on um, as part of the workshop, but I want to hear um, from a few other people. Um, you know, are there any other things that you kind of want to reflect on or that you reflect on that kind of jumped out at you in terms of the questions that we have here? You can put them in the chat or you can, uh, oh no, did I minimize that? I never know what happens if I minimize it. Uh, any, any other reflections or anything that anyone wants to reflect on? This is Emily. Um, Hi, Emily. And I really appreciate a lot of what Harvey said. Um, I think that the narrative that was shared was a conflict transformative story mm. in the sense that it was shaping um, shaping like how the events have been viewed and how they will be viewed in the future mm -hmm. at, um, events that led to movement within that conflict. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely appreciate what Harvey's saying. And one thing I was thinking about um, when listening to that was your question about who was left out of the story. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it was very much focused on leadership of mm -hmm. formal leadership of countries. So it was not looking at the people of those countries and how they begin to view one another. Yeah. Um, so in some sense, I think it was more of a clear mm -hmm. story as opposed, because it was, I wouldn't say it was simplistic, but it was definitely looking at certain things that happened to move the narrative forward. Mm -hmm. in a way. And I guess that's all narratives have that aspect to it, but it wasn't really looking into the complexity as much. Mm -hmm. as yeah. Thank you, Emily. Um, yeah, uh, again, I have some, I, I'll kind of pick up on that. Um, uh, is there anyone else who wants, and there's actually, um, so Mary Kate says in the chat, picking up also on the part where he mentions that neither party has violated the agreement, it sounds like more of a negative piece than a positive piece as an outcome. And in that, to me, it is not conflict transformative. Um, is there anyone else who has any other, any other thoughts they want to share before um, we kind of move on to uh, the third and final part of this workshop? The time is flying. I can't believe you guys are staying here for this long, to be honest. You all um, are staying here for this long. Anyone else have any? Um, thoughts to share? If, if that is not the case. So I will say, um, you know, I, I first of all want to say that I'm really excited to be able to share this all with you and hear. Um, and yes, okay, so this is what I was going to say. Mary Kate says, Palestinians are missing from the story. Yes, um, uh, that was what, you know, this is a story, right? Camp David, the story of Camp David um, is a story that is about Israel and Egypt, but in the larger story about the Palestinian Israeli, um, you know, uh, conflict. And um, there are very um, many ways. Um, and yes, to, to those that are, have to leave, thank you so much for joining. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, really happy to have you here. Um, so there are, there are, you know, there are a lot of different ways you can also describe the uh, Palestinian-Israeli conflict, um, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, 
can describe it with words like apartheid. You can describe it with words like self-determination for both sides, right? So um, I'm not going to go down into that because that would be a whole different workshop. But um, so Palestinians were missing from this story. That is, you know, it's one of those things where it's like this, this, this is a very defining um, peace agreement, right? And um, it, you know, it's, it's a peace agreement that did include actually elements um, of, uh, you know, what both countries, what Israel specifically was um, committed to be able to do to address, um, you know, Palestinian rights. And uh, Carter himself wrote in his 2006 book that those um, uh, things like autonomy, appreciable autonomy did not get realized. So it's, it would be very interesting actually, and I, I don't have the quote up, right away. Um, but I, you know, Stuart Eisenstadt tells this in a sense that, and I think it's important to think about why is it that Stuart Eisenstadt is telling it this way? Now, I can't answer that question. You can't answer that question. Only Stuart Eisenstadt can fully answer that question, right? But I mean, you can think about what is his, um, what, what is his um, position, right? So he is someone who was an advisor to Carter, right? He is someone who, for this book talk, it was a book talk. He had just released a book. So he wants to tell a very good story, right? And, and in that case, a positive story. In this case, it's framed as this is a very positive thing um, for, um, oh, and thank you so much, uh, Becky Carter, for saying the Palestinians were a significant portion of the negotiations. Unfortunately, follow-up follow steps were not taken as had been anticipated as the negotiations drew to a close. So again, another element of the story. I really appreciate you um, uh, sharing that there with us. Um, so basically that, you know, this is also what happens is that, you know, when you take a, a really long, big story that has a lot of elements and put it down into like a, you know, a, a three minute telling, there's a lot of nuance that's going to get lost in that. Um, I have a lot more that I could say on this specific subject, but I do want to move on. Um, I do appreciate everyone's reflections on it. Um, and I will talk a little bit about the context for why I pulled this, this clip um in the ne this next part so i'm going to go back to you can still see my slides right um i'm going to play from current slide so this is the third and, and final portion of our workshop again thank you all for um and then yeah thank you becky for joining us um and, and for adding to that conversation um so this is the final part and this is basically where i'm just going to try to pull out a little bit what i've learned from my research and my practice um, on a few more elements that I think are important for us to think about. Um, and these are not exhaustive elements, but just a few elements that I think are important to think about when we think about um, the narrative and conflict and conflict transformative stories. So uh, the first thing I want to talk a little bit about, um, and again, as always, would love to hear everyone else's uh, insights on, is objectivity. And I think that this is something that um, when we're talking about traditional storytelling, right? And especially like, let's think, let's take it as like, let's think about journalism for, for a moment. And in, in, you know, my role as the storyteller, I am in many ways a journalist, right? I am tasked with reporting the stories of our school in a way that is factual. Um, and so, you know, it, it's not like, you know, I'm not at the Washington Post or anything like that. And I'm not, you know, you know, unveiling corruption on the Hill or something like that. But, you know, I, there are, uh, it is a, there are journalistic elements to it. And I think objectivity is something that, you know, when you think about journalism, you think about needing objectivity, right? Um, I want to complicate this idea a bit because when you look at um, narrative and conflict uh, and you look at storytelling and you look at storytelling as a way not just to reflect the world, but to shape it, um, you realize that objectivity is a very um, slippery thing and that you don't really have objectivity in terms of pure neutrality, right? You're not going to be a person who has no thoughts whatsoever on how something is, right? You're not going to, you're not going to be able to approach a story and not have everything that you are, you know, your identities, your stories about yourself, your experiences in the world from the time you were born and have memory all the way up to, you know, the present. You're not going to be able to approach a story and just not have that anymore, right? You can actively try to um, be aware of that, and be cognizant of the ways that that might make you tell a story in a certain way versus another way. But you're not going to be, you know, just purely objective because pure objectivity just, it, it doesn't, and I know this might, this might be controversial for some people, but um, it just doesn't exist. Um, you have a position in the world and your story and the way you tell stories is going to come from that position. And I think what's important here too, and I think that this um, is not 
only important for storytelling, but especially for, and I know that this is going to be resonant for a lot of people on the call, for research, is that um, you are not more or less objective just because you're an outsider, right? Um, as an outsider to a conflict, right? And I am in many ways, like, for example, if I'm studying the Turkish-Kurdish conflict, I am an outsider to that conflict in many ways, right? Um, I am not Kurdish. I, am, I did not grow up in Turkey. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I am the third, you know, I am a third party in that conflict, right? Um, there are some people who might say, okay, that makes me more objective, right? That's not true. I have all of, you know, I grew up in the American education system, which, you know, the way it teaches the Middle East is a very specific view of the Middle East. And so I'm not going to be able to um, approach, you know, the Turkish Kurdish conflict without at least having some of that in my, in my background. I might not carry that with me, you know, I might actually push against those narratives, but, you know, I'm not going to be objective in that sense. I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not a neutral party necessarily. Um, I don't know if neutral is the right word there. Um, and in the same way, you know, I think that, you know, and this is, this is a whole, you know, a whole other discussion uh, about like decolonization and things like that. But I think there are a lot of assumptions too that if you're an insider to the conflict, you can you 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 shouldn't be trusted to be able to analyze the conflict itself because you're too close to it, right? That is also you know, and, and that's again couched in these terms of well, the outsider is more objective, and so therefore, if you're an insider, you can't possibly be objective. So I just kind of want to complicate this a bit, and this is true when you're when you're approaching it. With storytelling as well because again let's let's remember that if you are a storyteller you have power right you have the power to tell the story you might not have all encompassing power you know you might have an editor above you who also has power and is influencing you to tell the story in a certain way right um but you have a certain power so it's it's less about okay assuming that you're going to be able to be 100 objective and more about understanding what your position is in relation to the story so for example if i'm a carter school storyteller which i am and I am telling a story about the Carter School, right? Like my position is that obviously I want that story to be told in a way that reflects well upon the Carter School, right? Like I'm not going to go down into a deep investigation of, you know, um, you know, anything that you know, um, right? Like I, I, I am going to tell the story in a way that reflects well on the Carter School. Now there are different ways that I can do this, right? I can do it in a nuanced way in a way that acknowledges, and I think, for example, nuanced stories do reflect well in the school, right? Because you're talking about what worked, what didn't, right? Um, or I can do it in a way that doesn't pay attention to, you know, that, that it, you know, veers more towards, okay, what's the only, you know, only what's positive actually reflects well in the Carter School. So I'm not saying, you know, again, this is just what I've learned in my, um, my work. Um, uh, I just saw uh, Mary Kate says, thinking about awareness of our own subjectivity, what research resources do you have about becoming a conflict transformative storyteller and listener and the impact of listening on conflict? I really like that question. I'm going to get to that in a little bit, um, and, uh, but I'm gonna put a, I'm gonna put a mental note there uh, and come back to that in a little bit, Mary Kate. Um, so power, and this, you know, power here, I want to talk about not just um, power within the stories, for example, so here, you know, if we go back to the Camp David story, who has kind of the power in that story? It's the leaders, right? It's, you know, this is a story about Sadat, Carter, and Begin. So they have power in that story. Um, you know, the, the power dynamics in that story are such that um, focusing in on that uh, means that there are people within the story who are not being mentioned, um, but still have a, a role to play, right? So again, um, you know, talking about the people on the ground, right? How can you talk about uh, a story of peace if you're only talking about the people who negotiated it, right? And I think that's really um, a, a really uh, important note to make there. Um, I think another question is who gets to be complex? And I don't wanna go too deep into it, but I mean, I, I guess I'll just say, you know, um, when, you're, when you're talking about who gets to be complex, think about, you know, if, if, you, if you mess up, right? If you commit a crime or something like that, how would your story be told um, depending upon what the power dynamics are in your, in, 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 in the society that contains that story, right? And so that's very vague. I'll try to get a little bit more concrete here. This goes back to what Sarah Cobb and her work is about, is that this idea that narrative storytelling is the site of conflict. It is, it is where conflict happens. Um, 
And so when you say things like, why are some voices heard and others not heard? It's not enough to just be like, oh, we should just make those voices heard, right? You have to also ask, well, why is it that they aren't being heard? It's not because people aren't speaking, right? Um, if you're part of a community, and I'll get to, uh, to this a little bit more specifically with my thesis research, but if you're part of a community that's not being heard, right? You, you don't have books that are being published in your language, you know? your stories are not the stories that are on the news and the stories that are on the news are stories that villainize you right um that doesn't it's that doesn't just happen right it happens because we have structures in place that prioritize certain stories over others right so for example i'll, I'll give an example of um there's a current movement within publishing and specifically young adult publishing and middle grade publishing called own voices and this means stories that are told by people who share the identity or the lived experiences of the characters in their story, right? So for example, a Muslim writer writing a story about a Muslim, that could be own voices. It's more complex than that, but like that's, that's you know, kind of the idea behind it. Um, you know, you have to ask, why do we need a movement like that? Well, it's because those stories were missing or when they were told, they were told by people who did not have those lived experiences or, or did not come from that role. I'm gonna go a little bit more into this when I discuss uh, Elif Shafak. I'm gonna to try to do this really fast because I do wanna get a little bit more questions. Okay, um, but here, you know, the last question is who's responsible for making stories heard? And I just wanna say here, there's an infrastructure of storytelling, right? You've got editors and publishing houses who are deciding which stories get heard. Um, you've got, you know, media platforms that have greater resources, so they have a greater audience versus smaller platforms. They have, you know, a smaller audience, things like that. I want, you know, I'm not going to get too much into that, but there is an infrastructure of storytelling that determines who get, gets heard and who doesn't and how they get heard, right? And finally, um, I want to talk a little bit about hegemonic storytelling versus participatory storytelling. Um, so I want to say, you know, you might have heard kind of this phrase, right, from uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, uh, the danger of a single story, right? So a single story about Muslims, a single story about white people, a single story about Americans, a single story about, um, you know, uh, police, a single story about black people, right? Like, you can't have a single story because as many, you know, there are as many stories as there are people, right? And I think that, the, you know, what I wanna do here is also talk about the danger of a single storyteller. And this is where, for my, my work as a Carter School um, storyteller, I can be as attentive as I want, right? I can, and I can try to be as att attentive as I can to everything that I've talked about here to make sure that the stories that I'm telling are as elaborated, um, as conflict transformative as possible. I am still a single storyteller. I am Audrey Williams, who likes to write, write really long pieces. And because of that, um, you know, it's just a thing. You know, I like to write really long stories. Um, and some people like those and some people do not, right? Uh, I am Audrey Williams, I come from a certain background and so therefore I'm only gonna be able to see stories from that background and I can expand the way I see stories, but it's, you know, I'm still just me, right? So the danger of the single storyteller here is that, you know, if you really want to get into a place where we've got really broadly written conflict transformative storytelling, then you need multiple storytellers. You need to empower multiple storytellers. Um, and, you know, in the case of, okay, so you are not also going to be multiple storytellers, right? Like you're a single person. Um, so when you are the single storyteller, what can you do then to at least um, get towards participatory storytelling? So what you can do is you can look at, you know, your role. Um, if you're the author, you know, that's a different role. You're actually doing the writing of the story. You're doing the interviewing, you're doing the research, and then you're taking the different pieces and creating the story out of it. Okay. You're the editor. That means you're looking at someone else's writing, you're, someone else's story, and um, you're making decisions about what should stay and what should go and you know what should change and what shouldn't, right? Or maybe you're not, you're neither of these, but you're someone who has the resources um, to get people's stories out there, to platform other people's stories. Maybe you're someone who can financially compensate someone to write a story. Maybe you're someone who has a platform on which they can tell the story. You, maybe you're inviting them to an event, right, that you're hosting and then you want them to be a speaker. You're platforming someone's voice. Right? So you ask yourself, how can I do this in as participatory a way as possible? I'm not going to go too deep in deep into the specifics, but if you have specific questions, you can ask me. But um, what it looks like for me, specifically when I'm the author, I'll just say, is when I do my interviews, I try to pay as much attention, and Mary, the, Kate, to this, to this question, listen as closely as I can, and, and to the extent that I can, 
not go into it with the idea that I already have a story. I already know what story I want to tell, right? I try to listen to what story the person is telling and let the story become a, a little bit more organic from that sense, right? So I don't go into a story and say, well, this is the story and I just need this quote. I try to go into it like, well, maybe I have an idea of what the story is. And so I'm going to develop my questions to kind of try to find out more about that story. But I'm also going to try to listen in and see if there are any things that I might be missing that actually might be the story. And I just didn't know. You can do this, right, if you're writing a story. You can do this if you're a researcher, right? Um, you can do this if you're someone who, you know, a mediator. You're trying to listen to as many, you know, listen to as many people as possible, as many sides as possible. Um, Another element of participatory storytelling, which doesn't apply to everything, but in my job applies, is that um, you try to, like I try to, since my work is not investigatory, investigative, right? Like I'm not unveiling corruption or something, right? Um, my, my job usually, a lot of my work is actually about profiling people. Um, and so I want that profile to be as reflective of that person as possible. So I am going to, uh, you know, make sure that I not only listen closely to what they tell me, but once I've written a draft of the story, I'm going to send it back along to them. And this is where, you know, things get a little tricky. You know, you want to make sure that they feel that the they're being heard in the story and also know that you're, the, you're still the author, right? And I was actually very indebted. I, I, I was talking with someone last week as part of a story. And they, um, you know, they already had kind of this understanding of it too. And they said, you know, I've got a lot of, feedback for you. And I just want to say, you know, before I give you this feedback, remember, you're still the author, you are the one who gets to decide, you know, how to incorporate it and things like that. And I think that that's, that's kind of participatory storytelling to me. Now, there are other ways of participatory storytelling and we could go into. Um, but this is what it looks like from my vantage point. Um, and I want to say uh, on the hegemonic storytelling part, um, this concept, um, specifically for me in terms of thinking about this, came from a, an event that I uh, attended last week. Um, I'll, you know, if the recording is available, I'll try to find it. But it was given by um, Thor Morales, and he was the one who was talking about hegemonic storytelling versus participatory storytelling. So he's, he's not here, but I do want to make that note. Um, I'll put his name in, in the chat if you want to kind of look up his work. Um, I don't want to make it seem like, you know, I didn't come up with this. Um, uh, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about what I've learned from my research. I'm not going to go too in-depth because I want to, you know, get to a little bit more discussion. Um, but basically what I say is, I'm not, you know, objectivity, I've already talked a little bit about this. But again, um, you know, I've, I've come to realize that you can't be purely objective. You can't, you know, you're not going to be able to get outside of the stories that you have. Um, about yourself, about others, about the world. Um, but the way to then uh, grapple with this is to understand, okay, what are the stories that I'm telling about this already? You know, and then truly, you know, listen closely um, and try to, you know, again, thinking about what am I missing? You know, what, you know, it, it's like a thought experiment and it's hard because sometimes, you know, you hear a story and you're like, well, I have an emotional reaction to that story and I don't really want to listen to it. Um, so I don't have any like deep seated you know, tips and tricks for how to do that. I think it's just more of a, you know, maybe making a checklist for yourself, a, a mental reminder, like, okay, when I am doing this thing, when I am listening to this person, I need to step back and, you know, and it's cliche, but listen to listen, not listen to respond. In terms of power, um, I want to talk a little bit about kind of the material impact uh, and material repercussions of storytelling. Um, I think sometimes when we talk about stories, it's like, ah, oh, it's kind of like all up in the air, stories, yeah, okay, whatever. Um, you know, they're kind of fun, you know, they're just words. And that's not true. They're words, they're music, they're images and things like that, um, they're movements. But, um, you know, the case of Alicia Fock, I'll go over it really quickly. She's a Turkish um, author. Um, and she had a book called The Bastard of Istanbul, which deals uh, with the, um, uh, the legacy of the Armenian genocide in Turkey. And she actually ended up having a court case against her for um, the crime of insulting Turkishness. Um, and I was listening to a podcast this morning about this and her attorney actually had to create a defense for her Armenian characters to prove that they weren't actually insulting Turkishness. Um, so it, this, it was surreal, like her characters, the work of fiction became in many ways, kind of real entities in the courtroom, right? So that's a material repercussion. But that's like, you know, that's okay, that's like, it's a bad material repercussion, but then the other case I want to talk about is Musa Anter. I'll go through this really quickly, um, as quickly as I can. But basically, he was a um, Kurdish writer. He was known as Ape Musa, um, or Uncle Musa. 
Um, and he, um, you know, this, this really stuck out to me from a book that I read of his called um, My Remembrances. Uh, and in this he wrote, you know, these memories were remembered and written down in Kurdish. However, because of the um, fascist laws of the fascist administration, have banned speaking and writing in our own mother tongue, I have been forced to write this memoir in Turkish, a language that is foreign to me. I don't have as much time to unpack this as I would like and probably as it deserves, um, but I want to note here first, okay, fascist laws of a fascist administration, that is pretty morally clear language, right? Um, that's, you know, if you're looking for an example of morally clear, that's it, you know, fascist has a lot of, it, you're not mincing words, right? You're, you're, you're saying it, based on what you think it is, right? Um, but the other thing here too, is that you know, this is in a, itself, again, going back to the power of, of structures of power. Um, and again, why are the voices missing? It's not just because people aren't speaking, it's because in this case, for example, at the time that Musa Anter was writing, he was not allowed to write in Kurdish and publish in Kurdish. And in some places in Turkey, um, and again, this, I'm not being as complex as I would like here, you were not allowed to speak Kurdish. Right? Or speaking Kurdish could have uh, really great repercussions for you. Listening to music in Kurdish could have really great repercussions for you. Um, and the repercussion for him, um, I mean, this is again very linear, but like broadly speaking, I mean, you know, he did speak out uh, about uh, his Kurdish identity and about the Kurdish issue. And there are a lot, again, it's a lot very complex. But I think what I'm trying to show here is that he is someone who is a storyteller and he was assassinated. Um, in 1992, um, you know, and so I want to I want to uh, impress upon you. And I think we know this generally, but sometimes we forget is that storytelling is also like we're doing storytelling when we're living and and, and working in conflict resolution. And also, if you are a storyteller specifically, like you're a writer, and th like you know your job is to try to quote unquote shift the narrative or correct the narrative. Um, there can be material repercussions for that. You can be um, oppressed. You can you know your your work might not be published. You could be killed. For it. And that is what happened, unfortunately, for um, Ape Musa. So um, I have one more thing that I wanted to talk about, but I think I actually am gonna I'm gonna hold off on it because um, that's where I'm being indulgent. <laughs> I want to hear. You know, we have about ten minutes left, so I actually want to hear from all of you. Um, I do want to just go. Uh, you know, I just want to say one thing that I do to do participatory storytelling um, is at the end of the in each interview, and this idea came from Sarah Cobb actually. Um, when I asked her what, you know, how do I make sure that I'm getting the story that is actually there, not the story that I just think is there. Um, she said, you know, you should ask the, the, the interviewers, the inter people you're interviewing, what is the story to them, right? And so at the end of every, every interview, I ask, um, if a reader were to take one thing away from the story, what do you think it should be? I am not always able to include that in the article, but I try very hard because for me, that, that means that is what the person who's talking to me thinks this story is about. Um, and I want to make sure, to the extent that I can, that that gets in there because that is what's going to give the story integrity for them. Um, so here are just some questions uh, you can all read over. Um, these, you know, Mary Kate, this goes to your question a little bit of, you know, how do you kind of start becoming a conflict transformative storyteller? These are just some of the questions that I, I ask myself when I'm, I'm writing a story. You know, am I the person who needs to tell the story or is supposed to? Right, and with that, it goes back to position again, right? Like I could go, you know, write a story about, and this is something that I do ask myself, like if I wanna write a novel that's set in Turkey, I have to ask myself, am I the right person to do that? Even though I've studied Turkish, even though I've spent time in Turkey, am I the right person to do that? I'm not Turkish, right? I'm not Turkish and I'm not from Turkey, right? So is that, you know, is that the right thing to do? Why is the easy, you know, what is, what is the easy story to tell? And by that, what I mean is like, what is the story that, you know, you would, there would be no barriers to. Um, and I think that that's an important question to ask because then it's like, okay, then that's probably not, you know, you probably should try to do some work to kind of get away from that easy story, right? Because the easy story is probably one that isn't very conflict transformative. Maybe not always, but it probably isn't, right? Because it's probably too simple of a story. It's not elaborate enough. What are some elements that may be missing? Who is not getting heard, right? Which elements need to be morally clear and which need to be morally complex, right? Um, and that's, again, there are, there's not a single right answer to that, you know, I guess it's more of like, do you want to escalate this conflict or do you want to de-escalate this conflict? And I think it's more about knowing, having control over how to do that, right? Less like, well, only complexity is going to get us there or only clarity is going to get us there, but more, 
at this moment in time, I think that complexity is going to get us there, or I think that clarity is going to get us there. And I am ready to deal with the consequences should I be wrong, right? Um, how does the story fit into broader discourses, right? Um, again, story of the Camp David is a story of Camp David. It might be a story of Israeli-Egyptian uh, relations, but the broader discourse is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, right? There are other broader discourses there too. Um, whose voice needs to be heard in the story. So if you're talking about Camp David, probably the Palestinian voice needs to be heard in that story that um, uh, Stuart Eisenstadt was telling. Or again, not just the voices of Sadat and Carter and Begin, but the voices of actual people who were living in the conflict, right? Uh, other, you know, they were living in the conflict, but they also had a certain amount of power. Um, and then which part of the story am I willing to compromise on, right? So you might find yourself in a position where someone might be saying, okay, well, you should tell the story this way. Is that something you're willing to compromise on so that you can kind of like tell the story again a different way another day, right? Like, is it something that, you know, you can kind of live with so that you can get to the point where you can tell it the way you want to tell it? Or is it something that you really just can't move back on, right? You got it. You got to tell it this way. And if you can't tell it that way, then you would rather not tell it at all. So those are just some questions. I have taken up so much time. You all have been so patient with me. Um, I'm going to go to uh, discussion. I also am just going to leave this slide up. So if you know, for, for those who might be interested in storytelling, this also shows that you can do storytelling and conflict and narrative in a variety of different fields. Um, but yeah, we only have a few minutes left. I want to ask, you know, what questions everyone has or what comments or what insights y'all might, might want to discuss. I think someone unmuted. Who is it? Yeah, it's me, Seda. Hi, Seda. Yeah, and sorry, I haven't had a chance to respond to your personal, uh, your private messages yet. I will. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. okay. Thank you very much. So, yeah. you know, as a person from Turkey, I really, you know, enjoy listening your, you know, like experience and your stories. How you were talking about, the, you know, the the Kurdish hotel or Elif Shafak. Mm -hmm. But in the same time, uh, we also have to make sure that, you know, when we are talking these narratives, we have to generalize these issues because in 2011, for example, I was an exchange student in Greece. Mm -hmm. So in many parts of the Greece, I was not allowed to speak Turkish as a person, mm -hmm. you know, like who's coming from Turkey. Mm -hmm. So, or, you know, when you go to the Ukraine, Krim Tataria, you cannot speak, you know, uh, Krim Tatar Turkish languages. Yeah. So. This kind of things are always like, uh, you know, like global, uh, you know, like narratives issues. Yeah, yeah. So I was just wondering that how to be objective because as a person who is coming yeah. from Turkey and always listen to Turkish side stories rather than Kurdish because I am yeah. Turkish and I ident yeah. identify myself, you know, Turkish. So mm -hmm. I have to be like a super objective, you know, I think it's very, mm -hmm. very difficult task to be, you know. Right. Right. And I think, you know, I really appreciate that question. I appreciate, you know, um, the way you, you just there elaborated the broader story, right? Is that um, you elaborated that story to show that there are places where, um, uh, you know, speaking Turkish might uh, be dangerous, right? Or is dangerous, right? Yes. Um, and so that also offers a context um, that really elaborates the story. Um, in terms of your question, you know, I'm going to go back to, I don't think you can be 100%, you know, objective. Right, um, because you're never not going to be Seda. You're never not going to be Seda who is Turkish. Right? Um, you're not just. You're never not going to be who you are and have those experiences. But when you know where your position is, and you know you've already done that work of identifying that okay, that is something that I need to try to do is to maybe you know learn a little bit more, listen more to you know try to find those narratives. Then you can you can you can do the work um, of trying to find those narratives. Right. So. Um, social media, you know, uh, if you have Kurdish friends, um, you know, asking them, but also asking them in such a way that you understand that, you know, it, their trauma is not to be, um, try to, you know, say, you know, you are not entitled, entitled to the story. You are inviting their story. You want to listen to their story, but you're not entitled to that story. And I, I will use this as, an example. for example, I might want to learn more, for example, as someone who's white, in the United States learn more about the stories of my friends and colleagues who are black. I am not entitled to their story. So um, I think the other thing too is understand, and I've, there are times when I've been you know, good at this and there are times of when I've been bad at this um, in terms of you know, making sure you're also not fetishizing someone else's story. Um, and what I mean by that is like, you know, okay, I want to, you know, your story is simply a story meant to, to teach me 
right? And that's a way of, you know, actually removing the person from the story. So it's really hard. Like I don't have a lot of, but I think, you know, you seek out, you seek out the narratives that you can find on social media, um, in books, in, in movies and things like that. You try to then, you know, again, ask some of the questions of, okay, what's the easy story to tell? Why is it an easy story to tell? Um, you know, this story feels right to me. Why does it feel right? Um, you know, and then going like, okay, the story is morally clear. And then if, if it feels like the story is morally clear, and this is where I would say, I would, I would definitely, if you can pick up Solon's book, um, Root Narrative, because I didn't get to go too deep into this. But, um, you know, if a story is morally clear, what that means is that there is a complexity missing there that might be needed. So if you identify that a story is morally clear, even though you don't know what complexity is needed, you have at least identified that there is complexity that is needed, right? Um, and then you can do the work of figuring out how you're gonna go find that. How are you gonna go find those other stories? I don't know if that's helpful at all, um, but I really appreciate the question too. Um, and I think that this is, again, this is, this is a process. It's an iterative process, iterative process. The stories come to you over time. You're not gonna understand it, you know, 100% the way you want to understand it right now. But if you listen to a voice you might not have listened to, or if you watch a show that you might not have otherwise watched, maybe that'll add something to it, right? So, and then further down the line, you'll understand it better. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else have any questions, comments, questions? so much. I would love to hear more from all y'all. Sorry, I just, I think I want to add maybe yeah. um, another possible career path, which is yes. um, working in restorative justice. Um, mm. yeah. Thinking specifically about circle practice, not necessarily as, um, not always in conflict situations necessarily, but um, that when someone's facilitating a circle, um, it's the craft of um, eliciting stories from groups or uh, uh, asking questions that would elicit a story from every member of a group. Um, and then also honing one's own storytelling skills to be able to model that sharing in order to have the group um, better able to understand how they might be able to share their stories or feel comfortable sharing their stories. Yeah. I really appreciate you saying that. And I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna, I've noted that down and I'll try to share these notes with everyone. Um, actually, you know, let me go ahead and I've, I've been writing them down before we get going. Um, I've been writing them down in a, I don't know, a platform called Miro. I'm gonna, I'm gonna save the link and then, um, can I do that? I don't know if I can, okay, I'll figure it out later. But I'll, and I'll send it to you all. But um, to that point of, that you, you mentioned, you know, helping people tell their stories. And I think that's something that I, you know, I would have loved to have talked about today and didn't get to as much as that I, I would have liked to. But I think, you know, what I find so fascinating about this too, um, and I think it's really important for the, the conflict and narrative space is, you know, how can you, you know, how can you empower people to be better storytellers about themselves and about others, right? Um, because, and I, that's one of, you know, and I think, you know, you all know this already, but that's why I had the question of like, when, when you think of a storyteller, who do you think of? Um, really everyone is a storyteller, right? Um, and everyone, and what I love about narrative is that it is very accessible, right? You can learn how to tell stories, right? And you know, maybe you're not a writer, that's fine. Maybe you like to speak. Maybe, maybe you, you, you know, don't like to speak. Maybe you are not, you know, you're nonverbal. So you, 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 you know, don't use words, but you can tell a story through painting, right? Or, or things like that. Um, and I think helping people understand that they can be part of conflict resolution because they have those narrative tools available to them and then figuring out their strengths. I think that's really important. So I've, I've noted restorative justice and I really appreciate the addition of that. And we are at four o'clock, so I don't wanna keep everyone. Um, I don't know if, if there's anyone who has any other pressing questions and wants to stay on and ask them, I'm, I'm, I'm available, I'm happy, happy to answer. If you need to go, please do, um, but yeah. If not. Actually, I have a personal question. Yeah. Are, you are you planning to, uh, you know, like write in a story about the uh, Uyghur genocide is going on against the Uyghur, uh, you know, Muslims in China? Like as part of Carter School Storyteller? Yeah. 
I don't have any plans available. I mean, not available, like right now. Um, that is definitely, um, and I, I really appreciate you asking that because that kind of goes into like the Carter School storytelling process as well. Um, uh, I don't have any plans for that personally, but I would love to hear more about, you know, uh, what your thoughts are on that. And I, you know, I would, we, I have a meeting with our editorial team um, almost every week where we discuss different types of stories. And uh, some of the story, you know, most of the stories that we do, that I do specifically as well, are um, about people at the school or research at the school. But we do have commission pieces that we do um, with people. So people from our community um, will be, you know, will write maybe commentary or write a research-based uh, story and things like that. So what I would say is um, I'm gonna put the uh, Carter School News email in here. Um, and I would say, please reach out there with a broader, um, you know, and I'll keep an eye out for it. I, I will consider this as you communicating that that's a story that's needed. But if you want to talk more about it or, you know, go more into details and start getting into the process of it, you can email me here. Um, to Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I think that it just gets to a brighter point of, um, you know, there, that the news page on our, on our website is itself a discourse, right? And so there are stories that are there that are that are filling in gaps, and then there are silences that are there. And so the more that we can figure out ways to fill in those silences, I think, um, and within the process that we have, I think would be very good. Um, anyone else? Am I still sharing my screen? I'm going to stop sharing my screen because um, we've got okay, we've got six participants. Left. Okay, if anyone has any more questions, happy to chat. Um, thanks to everyone for for joining in, though. Um, and I will share slides and stuff to figure out a way to do it. But, yeah. Thank you all. Okay. Have a good rest of your week and please join other Carter School Peace Week events on the website. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.